Hi and welcome to today's talk. My name is Nicola Herbert and I'm one of the archivists here at the MS Company Archive in Leeds. Today we'll be looking at some of the amazing women who've been involved in the story of MS. From staff at our early penny bazaars to the female technologists behind some of our most iconic products and our current co-chief executive, we'll discover the stories of the women who've been instrumental in helping MS grow from market stall to international retailer. If you're watching the premiere of this talk, one of my colleagues is here to answer any questions in the chat on the right hand side. Otherwise, just email us at company.archive at marksandspencer.com with any queries. There are a few written records for the early years of MS, so we don't know much about our earliest employees. Michael Marks started out with a single market stall in the outside area of Kirkgate Market here in Leeds. There were wooden duck boards for the sales staff to stand on to keep their feet off the cold ground. This image shows the earliest staff photograph that we know of, taken in 1898 at our Oldham Street Penny Bazaar in Manchester. Amazingly, we know the names of all the women pictured here. From left to right, they are Ada Probert, Laura Calburn, Esther Brown, Sissy Rowland, Hilda Cartwright and Gertrude Proctor. One early employee we know more about is Esther Brown, who came to work for Michael Marks in 1893 at the age of 14. She was hired as a help for Michael's wife Hannah and went on to work on the Manchester Market Stall on Saturdays. She later joined full time and became manageress at our Cheatham Hill Penny Bazaar in Manchester until 1911. After she left MS, she lived in Australia for some time. For half a century, the company lost contact with Esther, but in 1964, the Welfare Department heard that she was seriously ill in a Manchester hospital and in difficult financial circumstances. As a result, and to recognise her past service, she was awarded a pension and rehoused at the expense of the MS Benevolent Trust. She is pictured here on the left at a celebration for her 90th birthday in 1969 and by the time she died, she was the only living person who could remember working with Michael Marks. This is an impression of the original market stool in Leeds, painted by the Welsh artist Van Jones in the 1950s. The women pictured in the painting were modelled on m and employees Laura Cowburn and Esther Brown, both pictured in that first photo I showed you. In the first years of trading, Michael Marks often took stools in the outside area markets as the rent was lower. However, an event in the 1890s ended his trading at stools in open markets. At Birkenhead Open Casual Market, a local girl engaged as a sales assistant contracted pneumonia after a spell of viciously cold weather, which led to her death. Michael was devastated by this and moved to trade only in covered markets and arcades from then on. Pictured here are the staff at Leeds Penny Bazaar in 1907. Gertie Nicholson was just 14 when she joined the staff of the Leeds Penny Bazaar at the Cross Arcade in 1906. She started working part-time doing midday to 8pm on Tuesdays and midday till 10pm on Saturdays for three shillings and sixpence and later took a full-time job which earned seven shillings and sixpence, which she considered to be a very good wage. Many years later, she describes the spiral staircases which led to stockrooms above each section of the store. This photograph was taken from the balcony of one of those stockrooms. Gertie was one of six girls on the tinware section, and she remembered taking turns to go up for lunch a quarter hour early to make the tea, and they had canteen cookers to warm up lunches that they brought from home. Just a note on comparing wages to today. It's really complicated to calculate historical spending power, for example, Gertie's full-time wage of seven shillings and sixpence can be estimated as the equivalent of about £30, but that doesn't take into account the other adjustments needed to calculate the real spending power of a wage, and calculations of the spending power of Gertie's seven shillings and sixpence vary hugely. Laura Cowburn, another of the women pictured in our earliest photo, was employed in 1895. She became the first office girl at the new warehouse that we had built on Derby Street in Manchester. At the time of this long service presentation in 1959, she was 78 and was described as the oldest human link in the business. Simon Marks gave her a gold watch as part of this special presentation. 
Let's shift focus slightly to take a look at the women involved behind the scenes. Our founder, Michael Marks, married Hannah Cohen in 1886 here in Leeds. Hannah was described as an immensely energetic, domineering little lady who ru ruled her husband and family. Hannah regularly helped Michael in the early years by preparing for the next day trading, for example, sewing sets of buttons onto cards to sell as a pack. Hannah was also a key motivation for her son, Simon Marks, to do well. After Michael's death, she was determined to work hard to earn a nest egg for herself and her daughter, Matilda, who had epilepsy. Hannah was involved in the business until her death in 1917. In 1957, Simon commemorated his mother by naming the business's new social centre after her. Hannah House in London included dining rooms, space for events and welfare facilities. Moving on to the Spencer side of M&S, Agnes Whitfield married Tom Spencer in 1892. She had been working as a teacher when she met Thomas while out buying Sunday school prizes for her students. Michael Marks formed a partnership with Thomas Spencer in 1894 to form M&S. After Thomas's death in 1905, Agnes stayed involved with the business as well as being a major shareholder. Two years before her death, she had given £400,000 to the M&S Benevolent Trust, which supported retired or sick members of staff. This was the bulk of her fortune, and she then left most of the remainder to the Agnes Spencer Charitable Trust. It's said that she visited her local stores to see how trade was doing right up until her 90th birthday, and she died in 1959, aged 98. Looking at the next generation of M&S women, Simon Marks married Miriam Seif in 1915. Miriam was the sister of Israel Seif, who was a good friend of Simon's. Israel joined M&S and later became chairman after Simon's death. Five years earlier, Israel Seif had re married Rebecca Marks, Simon's sister. Simon and Israel both grew up together in Manchester and now they had married each other's sisters. Miriam was known as a dynamic and colourful character, while Rebecca was a feminist and a campaigner. She attended the University of Manchester in the Women's Department to study English and later founded the Women's International Zionist Foundation. Her husband Israel later described her as direct, straightforward, always to the point. She was not an easy ally in the struggle for life. She believed in the truth and the telling of it and did nothing to dull its edge. Moving back a little to look at the development of staff at M&S, this is the story of Violet Pierce who joined M&S in 1902 at the Brixton Penny Bazaar in London. The first photograph shows Violet on her 16th birthday. She later said, My father was furious and after a day or two insisted that I hand in my notice. But our Miss Gibbs, who we will talk about more in a minute, was able to talk mother onto my side so that father was obliged to give his grudging consent. She recalls the opening day and what her life was like at their M&S thereafter. Staff welfare in those days consisted of a little eight foot room with a let down table. A gas ring was available for girls who brought their own meals. It was so cold in parts of the store, there was no heating of course, that we moved from one section to another so that the warmest corner might be shared by each girl in turn. The wind used to whistle through from one end of the bazaar to the other, but the situation improved with the installation of heaters which took pipes of hot water around the store. She continues, in 1905, I was asked to take over the managership of Fetter Lane. This was a big step up for me and mother was very proud. With my first week's wages, I bought a pendant watch to time the girl at lunch. I wore it on a long chain, I remember, most impressive. Of course, I had to have a black dress complete with white high boned collar and I wore my hair piled up on top, which showed that I was properly in command. You can see the middle photo showing Violet in her glory as a manageress. Violet went on to work at three other stores before finally, and she said this was her proudest moment, moving back to Brixton as a manageress. From there she became a stock taker and gained the title of Inspectress of Small Stores and travelled round the Midlands, often having to spend a weekend away from home in some remote coast town. In those days, you must remember, nice girls didn't travel on their own in strange towns, she said. 
of the last photo taken in retirement with her dog panda violet said this year i treated myself to some new style glasses you have to do something as you get older in 1909, the company discussed the idea of formal training for the first time, and the first official staff training role was given to a Miss Gibbs as a travelling manageress. She is pictured here along with her cash book. Her role was to train a number of assistants to become manageresses as the positions became available. Miss Gibbs was by all accounts a remarkable woman. Having been based in London for part of her career, she moved to Manchester where she was based in her new role. As time went on, the role of manageress did not mean so much the female title for a manager, but a separate role that was involved with welfare and training of the predominantly female workforce. By 1927, there were five female supervisors, but store managers were overwhelmingly male. Simon Marks became chairman in 1916. After the First World War, we moved away from the penny price point, which had been in place until then. M&S went through a period of great expansion in the 1920s, inspired by the big chain stores Simon Marks saw when he visited the USA. Sales assistants in the new larger stores on the high street had a tough manual job. As well as serving and restocking, they had to unpack stock as it arrived, including large boxes of glass and china. There were no porters at this time. Here are the staff at Harrogate and Wigan in the 1920s posing outside their shops. There's a brilliant array of 1920s hairstyles here, and you can also see that standard uniforms hadn't yet been in introduced. Henrietta Nash, an employee on the Wakefield Market Stall in the early 1920s, earned nine shillings for three days work, as well as a Christmas bonus, although there was no sick pay or holiday at this time. This compared well to 10 shillings a week for a full week's work in a factory. Let's talk about staff training and welfare. Our welfare department was introduced in 1933 by Flora Solomon, pictured on the bottom left. Flora said, my little department began with the introduction of subsidised staff canteens in every store. By the end of that year, a girl could have a substantial hot meal for sixpence, discreetly waived if she couldn't afford it, and tea in a cup with a saucer and a biscuit for a penny. Her lunch hour could be passed in an easy chair in a pleasant restroom with a magazine. It doesn't sound particularly revolutionary today, at the time that she was writing in the 1980s, but these innovations offended the hallowed doctrine for the stacking of every available square inch of space high with merchandise. By the 1950s, women working in stores could have their hair done at lunchtime, with their lunch served to them under the dryer. This might seem like a luxury, but also meant a great saving in time for working women. A staff manageress was appointed at each store to take personal interest in employees and provide them with support. Welfare committees were set up to deal with any hardships the store manager could not resolve. There was a growing realisation that proper rest and recreation were important if staff were to give the best to their work, and the staff welfare department offered inexpensive camping holidays with weekly deductions from wages to make payment easier, as pictured in the centre of this slide. Flora Solomon also established a staff training scheme in 1934, which she said was an essential part of any welfare scheme. This plan linked welfare training and administration in a pioneering way within retailing and aimed to enhance individual job satisfaction. We also provided sales assistants with a commercial education. Women working in stores would have periods at head office or touring the factories of our suppliers. We said a training department was born. We were now schooling those with the required aptitudes for promotion to more responsible tasks. And one rather more questionable passage read, a job at Marks and Spencer could be a career, even for a woman. Flora got involved in all aspects of shop girls' life, from teaching sales staff how to use makeup through to even educating people about contraception. We also worked to convince parents that M&S would be a suitable place for their daughters to work. We held store drop-in sessions with T, where the store manager explained how the welfare scheme would look after each assistant. The Second World War, of course, saw many challenges, one of which was a depleted workforce. Before the war broke out, there were 465 trainee male managers at M&S. By 1943, there were just 17. 
The answer, of course, was the promotion of women. Sales assistants were promoted to supervisors, and further up the business, women were promoted to management level. Younger girls were employed as sales assistants to fill these gaps. As the war went on, women were involved at almost every level across M&S. Here's an observation from an M&S employee returning to his role in the company following active service. The next thing which struck me was the high percentage of juveniles now employed in the store. To envisage a 15-year-old girl in charge of a counter was something foreign to my store experience, but I was favourably impressed by the competent manner in which some of these assistants were carrying out their duties. Air raid precaution training was given to all members of staff. Fire guard duty was compulsory for women between 25 and 40, with certain exceptions for those who were pregnant or for women who worked over 40 hours a week and kept house for herself and one other person over the age of 14. Air raid manual instructions stated that women could perform ARP positions just as well as men, although they weren't allowed to fire guard alone and always had to work in pairs. Marion Cotterell was one of many who served as a fire watcher in our stores. She's shown second right in the first photograph here, which was taken on the roof of Kirkcaldy store. Marion describes how the staff shared fire watching duty. If your turn was in the week, you still had to be in the counter the next day after being on duty all night, she said. Maud Clark from Hereford store remembered being left in charge of her store when the manager was called up. She received training in first aid, civil defence, firefighting and even an th intensive three-day course on aircraft spotting. She said that fire watching meant sleeping on a stretcher in the manager's office with buckets of water and stirrup pumps at the ready. They even had a cat called Victory. I want to quickly tell you in a bit more detail about two women who worked for M&S in the 40s. The first of these is Maud Dilling. Maud joined M&S in 1933 as a sales assistant in our Lewisham store. In 1940, she was selected as one of 75 women to train as an acting manageress in stores. And this letter informs her of her appointment to be acting manager at Gravesend store. Maud recalled, as younger men were called up, the remaining older and experienced managers took over their stores and we were to take over the young, smaller stores. Maud spent her training period at Eltham Store, where one of the main challenges was getting into work in the morning. She talks about accepting lifts from any cart or motorbike that offered. On the 13th of January 1941, she became the manager of Gravesend Store, which at the time had an all-female staff. She later wrote that really the staff were quite marvellous in keeping business going many being personally affected by the war and regularly spending their nights in air raid shelters. Post-war, Maud became staff manageress at Marble Arch store for 17 years. Working at this flagship London store, she met numerous members of European royalty and she was also the focus of a 1956 Daily Express article entitled The Domestic Revolution featured as a working wife who was able to come to business and run a home successfully as well. Afterwards, this letter from a colleague at Marble Arch was printed in our staff magazine. Maud retired in 1967 with 34 years service. Her retirement notice in our staff magazine stated that she has been a wonderful example and inspiration to many staff manageresses within the business and has been adored by the many hundreds of girls who have served under her. It wasn't just male staff who left their M&S roles to serve in the war. From December 1941, women were conscripted to work in industry or the armed forces. M&S colleagues worked at Bletchley Park and even helped but survivors of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp when it was liberated in 1945. This passage describes an M&S colleague called Georgina Beveridge, who first joined us at Fleetwood store, aged 18, in 1936. In the war, National Service took her across Europe. She worked in the forestry section of the Women's Land Army, ran a canteen for the Allied forces in Naples, and supported a barracks full of troops in Athens. She was described as one of the bright spots of the camp, and was awarded with the British Empire Medal in January 1945. 
Marketing from the 1940s, like this leaflet, encouraged women to join m and as a career. This leaflet was aimed at young women and their families. As well as younger girls joining m and more married women joined the workforce. This led to a significant shift in the patterns of shop employment and was accompanied by a shift from predominantly full-time work to more part-time work. This was partly due to unemployment being at a historic low and retailers battling with staff shortages. Retailers made their roles more tempting to working mothers juggling domestic duties and part-time work became much more commonplace. In 1957, 25% of shop workers were part-time, but a decade later, nearly a third were now part-time. By the 1940s, staff uniform had been standardised, and in the 1950s and 60s, staff were reminded that their appearance was an important part of the store's look. This poster would have been put on the store's notice board to remind staff that their appearance made for a good first impression. According to this poster, looking after one's uniform would have involved dusting spilt face powder from around the collar, repairing small tears and requesting permission to take it home to press it once a week. By the 1950s, we were producing copious amounts of training guidance for new colleagues to help them get off to a good start at m and This 1948 induction notebook encouraged staff to keep a personal record of their training. As well as providing sales assistance with all they needed to be able to do their job well in the 60s and 70s, we wanted our stores to be an appealing place to work. Whether Saturday staff or women embarking on a career at m and we pointed out that most supervisors had been promoted from sales assistants. I also wanted to include this excerpt from an oral history interview with a co colleague called Marion at Derby Store. In 2016, she marked 50 years of service with m and and she recalled what her training was like when she first started at m and working on ladies lingerie in 1966. I started on ladies' laundry. It wasn't called laundry then, it was underwear. And uh, everything had to be precise on the uh, counters. You couldn't have a thing out of line. And my job was the uh, 2011 briefs. And they had to be stacked and you couldn't have a gusset out of uh, line. For most of the 20th century, the majority of store managers across m and were male. These photographs from a staff magazine feature in 1970 profiled the four female store managers across the entire business. In the top left, there's Kathleen Blackwell, who first joined in 1936 as a sales assistant and was appointed as store manager in 1966. In the top left is Gladys Graham, who managed our Granger Market stall from 1965 onwards. In the bottom right is Phyllis Nash, who started out as a sales assistant in 1932, rose to supervising a department, then was a staff manageress, before being appointed as a store manager. She managed a team of 51 and was described as a soft-spoken pioneer in the men's world of business management. And then finally, in the bottom left was Diana Beaumont, who managed Felixstowe's store. She started as an office girl in Ipswich, progressing through the departmental management before becoming a store manager in 1959, when she was said to be the only female store manager in m and She said, I suppose I am a career woman, although I didn't deliberately set out for it to be that way. I think a woman manager must be more careful in behaviour than a man. You're more vulnerable to criticism somehow. From store managers to sales assistants, I'm now going to share with you a recruitment advert from 1970 to become one of Britain's favourite sales girls at Marks & Spencer Oxford Street. This really focuses on the benefits available to sales assistants at m and as we'll see. Join Marks & Spencer Oxford Street and be one of Britain's favourite sales girls. £28 a week at 18, £29 after three months plus cost of living supplement of £1.20 a week. A three course lunch for only five pence. Shampoo and set for 30 pence. A five day week with two out of three Saturdays off. Holiday arrangements on it and a bonus at Christmas. Full or part time. Apply to Marks and Spencer Marble Arch or Oxford Circus tomorrow. To round things off, let's look at the stories of a couple more female M&S colleagues. Elizabeth Tomalin was born in Dresden, Germany in 1912 
and went to school in Berlin. In the 30s, she fled Nazi Germany, and after a spell working in Paris for a textile designer, she settled in London. As war broke out, she worked for the Ministry of Information, where she helped to design the iconic posters that urged Britons to dig for victory. In the late 1940s, she was invited to become the head of the m and Textile Print Design Department, and she set about creating patterns that would be seen in clothing on high streets all over Britain. She instinctively knew the power of a print and how colourful patterns could make people feel good again, despite lingering austerity, and she set about transforming people's wardrobes. Elizabeth is pictured here hard at work on designs for Mars spun dresses, a fabric that was at the forefront of post-war m and fashion. The prints shown on the right were produced by m and during the years that Elizabeth headed up the print design department. At the age of 62, she moved to New York to study art therapy and set up a painting programme. She returned to Germany in the 70s, teaching art therapy there and across Europe until she was 94. She died in 2012 at the age of 100. Creativity must run in the Tomlin family as she is also the grandmother of designer Thomas Heatherwick. Some of our most iconic products have been developed by female technologists and product developers. From the chicken Kiev to pre-packaged sandwiches to our melt in the middle chocolate pudding. This is Sybil Barnes. She was head of our staff catering services in the 1970s, which meant that she was responsible for providing nutritious, good quality and affordable food for staff across m and she was also responsible for developing the project to introduce pre-packaged sandwiches at m and from 1980 and by 1987 sandwiches were on sale in all m and stores, all down to Sybil. Our next product developer, Cathy Chapman, oversaw all aspects of food product development during her time at m and from the iconic Chicken Kiev to some of our recent best ever food products. She joined m and as a product developer after going to catering college and working for a time in residential catering. At that time, m and was starting to look at more adventurous convenience foods for our customers. She worked on poultry and chicken products, which were a new added value addition to our ranges. It's developing the chicken Kiev that Cathy became known for, even convincing senior managers that yes, people all over the UK would want to eat such a garlicky product. Before that time, the Kiev was really a restaurant dish in the UK that most people wouldn't be cooking at home. From the beginning, the Chicken Kiev at m and was a fast seller. It was a game-changing product and was soon followed by other recipe dishes and paved the way for dishes now seen in every supermarket. Since then, she's been involved with or overseen the launch of thousands of products, everything from the Mexican, Spanish to Asian ranges at m and Cathy retired in 2018, but not before being named a lifetime influencer by The Telegraph and in the top 50 fabulous women by The Daily Mail. And finally, m and recently appointed a new leadership team, including Katie Bickerstaff as co-chief executive, the first woman to lead m and Katie has worked in a number of roles since joining m and in 2018, including as a non-executive director and as joint chief operating officer. In May this year, she was appointed co-chief executive alongside our new chief executive, Stuart Machin, and chief finance and strategy officer, Owen Tong. She'll be at the forefront of shaping m and over the next few years. Today, m and supports women in the workplace in many ways. 72% of our workforce is female, so all benefits have this in mind. Our board is 41% female. The company has a board diversity policy since 2012, which aims to maintain at least 30% female directors on the board. But of course, there's still more to do. We're taking steps to address the pipeline of women ready to move into senior roles by providing mentor and coaching. We want to encourage more men to take advantage of the strong, flexible working opportunities that already exist. We have an active and growing gender equality network, and we're taking actions to reduce our non-demographic gender pay gap by 25% by 25, 2025 compared to 2017. And that brings us to the end of our talk today, covering everyday inspirational women at m and from shop girls to scientists to CEOs. 
If you have any comments or questions, please do email us and thank you very much for joining us today.